everything we do is for the sake of happiness, to get away from pain and stress and suffering. And yet so often the things we do cause pain and suffering. This is why we have to train the mind. To look more carefully at what it's doing. As we were saying today, everybody everywhere tries to figure out why there's pain and suffering and how to get rid of it, but for the most part we tend to look outside. We're suffering because of what this person did or that person said, or because the weather is too hot, too cold. We don't have enough of this kind of food or that kind of shelter. Or it goes on and on and on. And our society encourages us to look outside for the causes of suffering and for the solution for that suffering. And there's something inside us that doesn't like to look at our own mistakes. I mean, it's one thing to act out of total ignorance, having no idea at all what we're doing and how it might cause suffering. But then over time we start doing certain things. We know that they lead to suffering, they lead to stress, and yet we continue to do them. We don't like to look at those decisions at all. Which makes it hard for us to really dig down and look at where the genuine causes of pain and suffering are coming from inside. And so it takes a while to internalize the message. We put up resistance. So not only does the Buddha have to teach us something that goes against our normal understanding of things, but he also has to come, overcome our resistance to wanting to understand it in a new way, to turn around and look at ourselves. So part of his teaching is to remind us, so this is the way everybody acts. It's not just you. And at the same time, he encourages us to develop good, strong concentration. So the mind will be in a better place to actually look at what it's doing from a slight distance, from a better perspective. When you've gotten some experience in finding the sources for happiness inside, so you realize that you're not a total miserable failure, then you can start looking at areas in which you've been less skillful. And see it not so much as a judgment on your character, as simply an area where your skill hasn't yet extended. That way it becomes more of a challenge and less of a dreaded judgment. So as we meditate, we tend to focus first on what you can do in the present moment to make things better. This is why the method of John Lee taught focuses on breathing in a comfortable way. So that you learn that you can do this. You can observe your breath and you can learn from uncomfortable breathing. Unfortunately, there's no moral stigma attached to the fact that you've been breathing in an uncomfortable way. It's simply just a practical issue. You have been paying attention, but if you pay attention you can start seeing what kind of breathing really does feel good now. Now, it's going to take a while to get really skilled at this, because sometimes a certain way of breathing that feels cool right now is actually not all that good for you, and you learn that over time. That is, you keep watching, keep observing, and develop a willingness to keep learning. You find that you get better and better at it, and once you have a sense of competence here, then it's easier to start looking at other areas of your life where you've been less skillful and approach them with more confidence. I made mistakes in the past, but I can make changes in the future. I can make made changes right now. That's the attitude you want to bring to different areas of your life. 
So for instance, if you notice that when you leave the monastery, the first couple of days things are going really well and then they start falling apart. On the one hand, you don't say, well, it's just a natural occurrence that you just have to accept. On the other hand, you don't blame yourself, because that doesn't get accomplished anything. You, get, you have the attitude of, well, let's see exactly where it starts to slip apart. Where does that first thread begin to unravel? And how does it connect to the next thread and the next thread? And maybe I can be more careful about that first thread. That's just especially easy when you're living out in this land of wrong view, where everybody is careless about their, the way they look at things and listen to things and allow the mind to give rise to greed, aversion, and delusion. It's very easy to go along with a gentle trend, but there is no safety in numbers. Just because lots of people are doing it doesn't mean that it's safe. And that it's wise. So this is where it's useful to develop your identity as a meditator. It falls in line with the instruction that Ananda once gave the nun, saying that conceit is something that we eventually want to overcome, but it's something that we can use on the path. It gets us started when we see that other people can gain awakening. You can say, well, they're people. Well, I'm a person. They can do it. Why can't I? And it's also useful in developing a word that we don't like here, a sense of shame. If you're going to be a meditator, there are certain things you should be ashamed to do. And not in the sense of saying that you're a bad person, but simply that realizing that that particular way of being careless or that particular way of giving in to your defilements is something that should be beneath you. And so a certain pride around the fact that you are practicing, that you are training the mind, can be a useful thing. You know, the pride of accomplishment. You've learned this much in the meditation. You've developed this many skills. And you don't want to let them just get washed away by the, the tides of your old habits. Or by the general tides that surround you when you aren't here at the monastery where you're not practicing with a group of people who are also practicing. You need a certain sense of your own distinctiveness. Okay, you are a meditator. You are someone who's trying to understand the causes of suffering. And it's good to take confidence from that fact. And have a little pride, not in the sense of thinking that you're better than other people, but simply taking pride in your accomplishments, your pride in your skills. And now that you've learned how to be behave in a skillful way, you don't want to throw that knowledge away. If you feel uncomfortable about developing a sense of pride, at least have respect for the skills that you've learned. In Thailand, they say, well, think about your teacher. What would he or she say if he or she saw you slipping up? That's where you begin to internalize your teacher. Of course, not taking on everything that he says or does without thinking. You've thought through it and you realize, well, this really is helpful to me. My teacher has been compassionate to me. Why can't I be compassionate to myself? And do what I know is the wise thing. And this way you build up a, a bank of arguments to use against your old defilements, to use against your old ways. What it comes down to is whatever works, you put it to use. And after all, you find that certain ways of thinking or certain ways of arguing with yourself don't work anymore or actually getting in the way, and then you put them aside. It 
So just because a particular attitude is not totally enlightened doesn't mean that it can't work. Remember, we're on a path here, and there are stages on the path. And we're not here to clone awakening, to pretend that we're awakened people, or to what someone once called to follow the practice of being already awakened. Because what we're doing is just, that would be just guesswork. What would an awakened person say now? Well, we're not for sure. But we act in what seems to be the most awakened course, and then see if we can learn. Was it a mistake? Was it not a mistake? An important lesson in the practice is, even though you should have pride as a craftsperson in this, pride of a craftsperson doesn't mean that you pretend that you did something right when it was not. The pride of a craftsperson is being willing to recognize a mistake, recognize a, a failing in your skill, and having the desire to want to close up that gap. That's a useful form of pride. So we work on getting the mind to settle down and make that a skill. And then once you've got the confidence of being a skillful in one area, you try to extend it to cover other areas of your life as well. And that's how the practice grows. And this is especially true as you get deeper into concentration, because the mind that's still is the mind that can see clearly what's working and what's not. It has a clearer idea of what it means to work, because you're getting more and more sensitive to the movements of the mind and also the different levels of stress in the mind. You begin to see that there are fluctuations in the level of stress, and that they're connected to things that you're actually doing. This is how people go from one level of jhana, say, to another level. They begin to see that what originally was the greatest level of stillness they'd ever attained still has some fluctuations, still has some drawbacks. So you've got to ask yourself, well, what am I doing? What, how am I approaching the breath? How am I relating to the breath in a way that's causing that fluctuation or causing that stress? Then the mind will move to a different level. Once you finally see, oh, it's this I'm doing, and you let go of it, i.e. you stop doing it. And sometimes it seems to be something that you needed in, to do in order to get the mind into concentration, but the skills you need to get the mind into concentration and to keep it in concentration are slightly different. As in the beginning, you're fighting off all kinds of distractions. And then as those distractions fall away, some of the tension that was needed to get you in concentration to keep you to have a very clear line, okay, you've got to stay right here, you can't go outside this line. If you go outside this line, you're going to get in trouble. So there's a certain tension built up around protecting your concentration. But as the concentration gets stronger, you don't need that level of protection. And John Fung's analogy was of pouring cement. When you first pour the cement, you need the forms. If you take away the forms before the cement is hardened, it just flows out all over the place. There comes a point, though, when the cement has hardened enough, you can take the forms, forms off. And the, mis <coughs> and the cement stays right where it is. So it's in this process of trying to get the mind as still as possible that you actually develop discernment into what the mind is doing, where it's causing stress, and how you can observe the stress rising and falling, and that way you comprehend it, see where it's coming from, and then you can just abandon whatever it is that's causing it. So you're getting practice in the Four Noble Truths, regardless of whether it's the first jhana, the second jhana, the, the one and the half jhana, or however many jhanas there may be.
if you have this attitude, it doesn't really matter what level of concentration you've attained. You can learn from it. And that's a sign of a person with real discernment. And John Lee's comment was that a person of discernment is someone who can take whatever you've got and get good use out of it. And so you take the level of concentration you have now and try to learn from it. Try to become more skillful in how you approach it. And then you try to take that attitude of wanting to be skillful and you expand its range. Using the power of concentration you develop to give yourself a sense of well-being that makes it easier to stick with that intention. And the confidence that comes from concentration that helps you stick with that intention. And then try to make it more and more your common way of functioning. So that when you catch yourself being unskillful, you don't beat yourself up. You simply notice the fact and say, okay, I've got to shift my attitude. I'm doing something wrong here. Remember those duties for the Four Noble Truths. If you're making a mistake, it's probably because you're abandoning the path, or you're trying to abandon the stress, which you can't do. You've got to straighten out your conception of, okay, what are the duties I've got to do right now? What am I faced with right now? And which duty is appropriate right here? If I'm unclear about what's happening, we'll try to see if you can comprehend where is the stress right now, and develop whatever mindfulness and continuity of awareness is needed so you can really see it. And when you see the stress, okay, look and see what else is coming around with the stress. In other words, what arises at the same time the stress does and what it passes away at the same time the stress passes away. There will be times in the practice where it seems like all the different duties of the Four Noble Truths are functioning together in a seamless way. But when things break down, that's when you've got to stop and say, okay, where have I missed the categories of the Four Noble Truths and what duties am I misapplying? It's like driving a car. As long as the car is functioning, you don't have to think too much about what's going on in the engine. But when it starts malfunctioning, that's when you have to start thinking about it, trying to figure out whether it's the battery or the spark plug or whatever. That's when you have to analyze it. But when it's functioning smoothly, you just keep making sure that it's, the car is pointed in the direction you want to go, and you're running it properly, and all the parts work together. It's in this way that in, in internalizing your teacher, you become your own teacher. You get more confident, you get more capable, you get more competent. And you find that you can rely on yourself more and more in any situation to do the skillful thing.